to everyone here in the room and also to those who will follow us through the web. I'm Valery Kurtui and I'm very happy to welcome you to this session on behalf of ESA Management and I hope you will enjoy this morning session and uh, you will follow with high interest uh, the discussion. Doesn't work? Now, okay. I hope you will, you will follow with great interest this discussion uh, in, in this session. The session will be co-chaired by two distinguished scientists, and I have a great pleasure to introduce to you first Professor Androniki Naska. She is Professor of Hygiene and Epidemiology at the University of Athens Medical School, and she's been a member of the scientific panel of EFSA on uh, nutrition, dietary products, and allergies since 2012, and currently she also has the role as vice chair of, of this panel. So thank you very much, Professor Naska, for accepting this role today. And then I have a great honor to welcome as co-chair Dr. Yunxi Chen from the China National Center for Food Safety Risk Assessment in Beijing. Dr. Chen has more than 50 years experience in nutrition and food research, and I hope you would agree with me that it's impossible to summarize in a few words such a long experience and activity. And just to pick some of the most recent and current involvements of Dr. Chen, I will, say, uh, will, I will mention that he's the chair of the Chinese National Expert Committee for Food Safety Risk Assessment. He's the vice chair of the National Food Safety Standard Reviewing Committee. He also serves as the chairperson of the Codex Committee on Food Additives, and is a member of the WHO Food Safety Expert Panel. So I thank you, Dr. Chen, immensely for making all the efforts to come and be uh, with us today. And with this, I wish you all uh, an enjoyable, enjoyable morning session, and I hand it over to the chair for running the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words and the kind invitation. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of my co-chair, Dr. Kunchi Chen, and the session's reporter, Dr. Silvia Valtuena Martinez, we welcome you to this session. I will be louder. Uh, I would like to join Professor Naska to welcome you. So the second day of the conference will provide insights to the future of the assessment science. And it is the nutrition challenges that we are going to address in these rooms. In this room, and I'm sure you will agree with me that the, our understanding of the interplay between nutrition and health promotion or disease risk has substantially advanced during the past decades but the accumulated knowledge has also generated new paths to be addressed. So our speakers this morning will summarize the current evidence and will also present, will set the future goals for assessment at the individual level as food for me in section two, which was in the slide which was projected before. <laughs> And uh, then moving to section three at a broader perspective, the global environment as food for us. About the logistics, as you can see in the slide and also in the program, the session is organized into four sections. We'll be having a short break between section two and three. If it is possible, time will be given for a few short questions, mainly requests for clarifications after each presentation. But I would like to kindly ask you to reserve your questions that will spark the discussion for later, for the end of the session. And I would also like to kindly invite the speakers to respect the schedule so that time will be left to exchange ideas with the audience. 
So after this very short introduction, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Sanders, who will present nutrition in the 21st century. Tom Sanders is currently an Emeritus Professor of Nutrition and Dietetics at King's College of the University of London, where he was Professor and Head of the Diabetes and Nutritional Sciences Division in the School of Medicine until his recent retirement. Through his involvement in large European projects and trials, Professor Sanders is a leading expert on the role of fats and fatty acids in cardiometabolic risk. It is with special excitement that I introduce Professor Sanders as I was one of his students during my MSc studies. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Ephesa, inviting me to talk to this distinguished audience and allowing me to give my view, I think, of what is going to happen in the 21st century, what the challenges are. So I, I think there are three main areas that we need to concentrate on. Um, the first one is the aging population. Uh, and I think generally the, the changing demographics of the European population. Some countries in Southern Europe actually are decreasing. So I think uh, Spain, Greece, uh, Italy are decreasing by about 5% um, in, in population, uh, reduced fertility rates, um, and then people are, li are living much longer. Now, living longer uh, brings a lot of new challenges, and particularly you get a lot of age-related frailty diseases coming up. So that's something we're really going to need to, to think about. We have made a lot of headway in reducing cardiovascular disease, and also reducing diseases like lung cancer through smoking cessation. The second area is the whole area of obesity, which is um, engulfing the population at, at the moment, particularly those in lowest socioeconomic groups. And there's a worrying increase in obesity in, in really quite young children, about the age of, of, of six or, or, or seven. And it's, it's actually worse in Southern Europe than Northern Europe. And the worry is that children who are fat uh, will become fatter adults, and they will develop all of the disorders associated with um, aging much earlier. And so they may uh, die before their parents, I think, is, is, is the, the concern. And then the other area we have is to, more to do with uh, food security, climate change, which I think is a reality. Uh, there are a lot of people out there denying it. And we do need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We need to use food, um, waste less food. We need to have more efficient methods of producing food. And we need to think about conserving water. Water availability is a big issue in, in southern Europe. Coming from the UK and you know the British Isles, generally it rains a lot there. You might realise that. So we don't particularly have a problem, but you know there are parts of Europe where water is 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 a problem. So I, I think when we look at how we feed people in the future, we're also going to have to think of where we sit in competition with other countries. So India, China have uh, increasing populations with increasing demands for for meat, et cetera. So food on a global market will come probably more, to, uh, m more expensive, I think, and we will be looking more to what we can produce in, inside Europe. So just looking at the age structure of Europe, um, the uh, bordered bars are the structure of the population now, and the filled bars um, are where we'd be in 2080. Um, so a huge number of people in the very old country, 80 plus. And it, it's said nowadays that people aged 60 can probably expect to live into their, their 90s. Um, I think you know, the, the issue of living, to, living very long is, is actually quite frightening, but it's, it's actually quality of life that matters, not, not years. So, if people live to a ripe old age and drop dead suddenly, that's fine. But if they are in a, a period of gradual decline, loss of function, that has huge, huge implications for, for health care. The uh, poet and playwright William Shakespeare wrote a, 
about the seven ages of man, and he adequately characterized the seventh age of man, the last age, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. And what happens when people get very old, they have problems with their teeth, they may have drying up of salivation, difficulty swallowing foods, they have visual loss, uh, either you know cataract, which is, can be fixed, or age-related maculopathies, problem, loss of taste, so they may want to add more salt to food, Dementia, so difficulty in terms of um, buying food, preparing food, and then there's the whole issues of loss of mobility and dexterity. And living alone is a real problem for older people, particularly for men who often have no food skills for preparation. Arthritis, disability make opening tins, food packaging difficult. Um, the very small fonts on labels make it virtually impossible for people to read, uh, older people to read the labels. So um, labeling information is a bit of a problem. Um, dentition, certain foods are difficult to eat, like nuts and fruit and vegetables. Being housebound means they require vitamin D in the diet. They, a lot of old people are on multiple medications. Some of those medications do interfere with interact with diet, um, and then you have problems about fluid intake. Um, so there may be prostate problems in men, there may be other continence problems, which mean older people quite often restrict fluid intake, and that exacerbates renal problems as well. So there are uh, a variety of, of problems that occur in older people. When we look at obesity, this is a, a map 2000. 2005 prevalence of obesity in, in men. Um, you can see uh, Ireland, uh, UK, um, Italy of high rates, but you notice the highest rates of obesity actually are in Greece um, um, and the former sort of Yugoslavia area. Um, and obesity is increasing throughout out Europe, and it's, it's very disturbing. Um, it's this, to see the extreme obesity increasing. So the fat are getting much fatter. It's not just people going over a body mass index of, um, of 30. It's the people who are 35 plus. If you go into any major shopping center in, in the UK, you will see a large, a lot of very, very large people there. And that brings with it a lot of health problems. And I mentioned there's a concern about children, and this top slide shows the instance of overweight in European countries. And what you can see in southern European countries, the instance of overweight is, is, is higher in children. It's about 40% as opposed to 25% in northern Europe. And when you go to obesity, you can see obesity is running around about 10% in northern Europe and in southern Europe. Um, it's over 20% in, in six to seven year olds. Six, well, six, seven, eight, nine year olds. Um, a very worrying trend. What the cause of it is, um, is combination of excess food intake coupled with very low levels of physical activity. The third area I think is about you know, climate change to touch on, which really relates to the types of foods that make up our diet and particularly Diets that are high in meat um, use up much more carbon, uh, produce much more carbon dioxide and also methane um, if it's from ruminant animals. And if people are going to eat more meat, there's this great fashion of paleolithic diet, which is eating lots of meat, going around clubbing animals and things like that. Well, it's not very good for the environment. I mean, a cereal-based diet, mainly uh, fruit and vegetables, is, is much better for the diet. In, in the context of Northern Europe, a lot of Northern Europe is very suitable for ruminant agriculture, for dairying, and it's been practiced for sort of 15,000 years. So I, I think it's not so much uh, ruminant agriculture um, should be decreased, but actually really total meat intake. So people got used to eating less meat in the diet, maybe only eating meat, you know, 
once a red meat once a week or so and, and chicken and fish a little bit more and more plant alternatives, that would reduce our, our footprint um, in terms of CO2 production. The new technologies we have, and uh, technologies tend to drive science. So if you have a gadget, uh, you can apply to um, get grant funding. So um, a lot has been made about novel foods. Despite the approval of genetically modified foods in, in Europe, there's very low usage of GM foods in Europe because of consumer resistance to it. And that's the problem when you introduce a technology, the science may be okay, but if the consumers don't like it, um, it won't come widespread. We have this promise of personalized nutrition um, that be able to do genetic testing. We can have your human genome on a, a, a chip and you might be able to say, well, you know, should I eat this sort of diet versus another diet? Well, the, the effects uh, wrought by polymorphisms, common uh, variations, are, are really quite minor uh, when we've looked at diet nutrient interactions. And from a public health point of view, actually what we want to look at is, is really the whole population. So I think a lot has been held out on, promised, if you like, on, on genetics, but I, I don't really think it's going to have a big impact on uh, the big public health. I think epigenetics and nutritional programming are much more important. I think what's happening in, in mothers in pregnancy and children in early life may be very important for predicting diseases in, in the future. And I think the real area of concern is the, one, the increased prevalence of obesity uh, in pregnancy, which is increasing hyperglycemia in pregnancy, creating gestational diabetes, and we know that children born to mothers have gestational diabetes are more likely to then develop diabetes in, in later life. Um, so that, that's a, a real concern. The other one is the changes in reproductive habits of women. So women having children later in life, in their late 30s and 40s, makes them also more likely to get diabetes because the risk goes up as you get older. So there are things that are happening now that may impact on the next generation. So I think programming is really important. And then we have information technology. So social media um, is one form of it, but we also have supermarkets being able to track what foods and who eats what. Uh, we haven't got to the point where you're weighed at the checkout, how much food you've got in, what your calories are, and how overweight you are. Um, there's a lot of work going on about you know, getting food to people, uh, online shopping, um, and one might see this as potentially an advantage for older people, but it's, it may not be, because old people, one of the things they do like doing is going out shopping. It's a way to socially interact. I also think that IT may be part uh, of the problem. Um, children sitting down playing computer games large periods of time or times on screen, if you like, are not taking physical activity. And I think the increased use of computers in the workplace make us more and more sedentary. And so that does probably contribute to the problems about uh, obesity. So let's look a little bit more at the risks in elders. Uh, cardiovascular disease is the main cause of death, leading cause of death, mainly coronary disease, but then stroke. The older you get, the more likely you are to have a stroke. I don't think there's anything particularly wrong with coronary heart disease, providing it occurs at a ripe old age. Uh, I had a relative who died a couple of weeks ago uh, he'd been physically active doing the garden. He sat down in his bed and he had a major heart attack and died. And it's a shock for those around him, but it's a not bad way to go. It's certainly better than a lingering death from cancer or, or dementia. So the issue about cardiovascular disease, I think, is to delay the onset of cardiovascular disease as, as late as possible. Cancer, older people get, the more cancer likely are to get cancer. We know the known causes of cancer, smoking. We know that obesity contributes to it. And 
alcohol uh, are major things. When it comes to other aspects of diet, the, the relationship is, is very much weaker. It looks like fruit and vegetable consumption is not as strong as we thought it was 10 years ago. We thought that fruit and veg would protect against cancer. The things that come out again and again, alcohol, excess alcohol intake, or even moderate alcohol intake, increased risk of cancer, um, and, and so does obesity. Diabetes is, is potentially going to be an even bigger problem with increasing obesity rates. As you get older, your risk of getting diabetes goes up, independent really of how fat you are. But if you're fat as well, then that's going to be worse. And diabetes leads to renal failure, contributes to blindness, limb loss, and all sorts of other things. And then we have the anemia chronic disease. We have bone health, osteoporosis. So if you have bone problems, it reduces morbidity, uh, mobility. And then we have sarcopenia, which is sort of also tied in with low physical activity, it's muscle loss, and then dementia and, and blindness. It's pretty grim, really, isn't it? Um, but looking at cardiovascular disease, I think where it's, oh, I'm talking about older people, where it's really important to focus is on the younger generation, because the underlying pathology that leads to cardiovascular disease <coughs> develops over a period of um, 30, 40 years. So uh, uh, silently from fatty streak formation in the artery to plaques formation, then plaques grow, and then what causes it triggers a heart attack or stroke is normally plaque rupture uh, and thrombosis. And so this is where, from the public health point of view, what we've got to do is, is reduce the factors that produce uh, atherosclerosis in the whole population. And we, we know what the risk factors are for cardiovascular disease. Smoking is a very potent one in, in Europe uh, with a background diet. And the other major one, particularly for coronary disease, is blood cholesterol. Um, blood pressure is a stronger risk factor for stroke, but it, it also contributes a lot to, uh, in terms of mortality to heart disease. And I think we've made a lot of inroads in controlling blood pressure and and cholesterol in recent years in Europe. But I say diabetes is going up, um, people are doing less exercise and they are overweight. Um, heredity is a, a factor in there, but you can't change your parents. I just want to show you a little bit about progress we've been making in cardiovascular disease. Now, these bars show are compared to French men aged 75 to 79. There's a bit of paradox about the the French. Uh, French enjoy their food, they drink quite a lot, and they have the lowest cardiovascular disease rate in Europe. Uh, one English cardiologist had the view that the French couldn't count um, and classified death, but this more recent data, which is actually done by British authors, does actually show actually United Kingdom now has the lowest rate of cardiovascular disease in total in Europe above the French. But what you can see is the Eastern Europe uh, has very, very high rates of cardiovascular disease. So 55-year-olds to 60-year-olds have the same death rate from um, cardiovascular disease as 75 to 79-year-olds in France. So if you can Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russian Federation, all appalling rates. And um, Poland, um, down here, Czech Republic, have got rates that are, you know, 10... They, 10 years um, younger have the same rates as people 75 to 79. If you look at coronary disease, though, what you can see is the French are actually very low in coronary disease here. And Switzerland, surprise, is actually the best place to live to coronary disease. But, and again, you've got the Eastern European blocks out here. Uh, UK, Ireland, has Sweden have a similar rates of coronary disease. It seems why the French don't do quite so well with total cardiovascular disease, they have more stroke, and that's probably related to higher alcohol intake, which is quite well known. So I think a lot of this variation in cardiovascular disease in, in Europe, some of it is to do with high rates of cigarette smoking persisting there, but there's also what I call the vodka factor in there, um, which is quite well known. The UK, uh, we've got quite good data now on circular uh, diseases, and 
we've made amazing progress. To, you know, 55% um, fall in uh, in in mortality rates, and there are a lot of people out there who want to take credit for this in in the UK, and you know, it's well above the target. And there's been an estimate working out where this reduction has come. Now, when you look at the risk factors, you know, diabetes, obesity has actually got worse. Some of the treatments have got better, so we have uh, better management of high cholesterol with statins, um, better management of people with chronic coronary artery disease, um, and better prevention when someone's had a heart attack uh, is, is much, much better. But risk factors have got better, and the, the striking thing in the UK is a fall in population blood pressure. Now, we don't really know why this is. It may be an intergenerational effect that may reflect better maternal nutrition in the post-war period that's now working its way through. It could be in secular increases in height. We know that people who are taller have lower blood pressure. It could be due to the fact that UK has got food manufacturers to reduce the salt content of food. And salt intakes have dropped quite a bit in the UK, down to uh, seven, eight grams a day, from where they used to be about 11 grams a day. Smoking, um, slightly better, not really. Fruit and veg have gone up. Cholesterol's gone down a little. But a lot of it is, is unexplained. The improvements we've seen in health are now threatened to be eroded. This is uh, not me on my summer holiday in Bali, I just say. It's, uh, and uh, this chap here is the KFC. He's Colonel Sanders. I just would like to make clear uh, there's no conflict of interest here. He's not a family member. Uh, but it does appear we, we, where there is increased availability of high-calorie, quick-serve food, you start to get these increases in obesity of American culture. And we're seeing it very strongly in, in the UK. And I said it's, it's predominantly in low socioeconomic groups. Cheap, high calorie food. It's not, it's not nutritious, it is nutritious, because we can see the rats that feed on the food that's thrown away in litter uh, are, are very big now. So you know, they grow well on it. The, the problem with increases in, in BMI is that mortality goes up quite a This is data from a prospective studies collaboration that show a J-shaped curve. So what it shows is that people actually are underweight are increased risk of dying. But once you go above a desirable weight, then for men, your risk goes up. For women, women can be a little bit plumper than men, and their rates of death are, are lower. But underweight is still a problem. But when they go up, in weight, the all-cause mortality goes up. And the big increase really is in coronary cardiovascular disease mortality going up. There are, is a, some in contribution to cancer in both males and females, and particularly uh, colorectal cancer in, in men and uh, breast cancer in, in women, postmenopause breast cancer. What you'll notice here, though, is respiratory disease is associated more with with underweight. Um, so we need to keep people in a healthy weight. So being too light is probably not a, a, a good idea. And the comorbidities associated with obesity uh, are enormous. So, so severe obesity will cause problems about breathing, uh, obstructive sleep apnea. And we know we can save people's lives by doing bariatric surgery. Um, that, that, that's what a lot of the uh, reasons for doing uh, bariatric surgery are. But the major risk really is, is, is diabetes um, and all the morbidity that goes with, with diabetes. And in the UK, we've started to see a phenomenal increase in primary admissions for obesity into hospitals. And it's in the slightly, it's more in the younger age groups, 35, 40 to 54, really, we're seeing the big increases, middle age. Um, not so much in, in the youngest age groups or in, in the old. But if we look at you know, total admissions, including secondary admissions, so these are people with problems like sleep apnea, reproductive problems uh, associated with obesity. If we look at the relationship with diabetes, uh, as you get fatter, 
your risk of diabetes really increases phenomenally. These are big risk factors. You know, you, when you're going up to 38-fold risk, that's a huge increase. So some of the epidemiological studies are showing, you know, a 0.2 uh, increase in risk with sugar-sweetened beverages. Compare it to a 38-fold increase. You know, it, it's not just not significant. So this is the big driver of diabetes, and what we're seeing is a huge increase in, in diabetes. And it, this is occurring at slightly older age groups because most white adults are presenting with diabetes at the age about 58. With Asian, Afro-Caribbean, it tends to be about 10 years younger. But we're seeing a disturbing increase in, um, in the younger groups as well uh, here. So this is 25% of hospital patients in the UK now have diabetes. And that brings in all sorts of complications and costs to the health service. And I think this is the same in, in Germany and other uh, northern European countries. So we have to do something about this. And I think it's, it's to do with about availability of foods high in fat and sugar um, everywhere. And you, know, you get these little things like 1,600 kilocalories in a pot of these. And it's quite easy to get through these and with a cup of coffee. And we have all the snack foods like crisp, grab backs, impulse purchase material. People go to the cinema now. They can't go to the cinema in the UK without crunching through popcorn or large containers of sugary drinks. Um, so that's come part of our culture. We need to change the culture about where people have this expectation, they go shopping, they have to stop for a bijou snackette, you know, to eat something. And I think there's been a change, and this is part of it, which is from what I, we call slow food to fast food. So slow food, you prepare your food from basic ingredients, you have set meal times, you have some social control on meals. And, you know, plate size is important. I noticed yesterday we were all given quite small plates, so I'm glad that... EFSA has got the message that plate size restricts the intake of food. If you give people a big plate, they fill it up. Um, and I think the problem is we've, these fast foods, they are nutrition, but they're very energy dense, and there's no meal planning, and fast food outlets do encourage people to eat more. They said, do you want to upsize your portion? Would you like a biscuit with your coffee? And there is a lot of inducement to, to indulge, and I think we need to change. That's a big thing about changing culture, particularly for young people. And physical inactivity is important. A study last week showing Dutch, um, who cycled, I think, lived six months longer, and that's taking into account, obviously, road traffic accidents but, uh, than those who didn't. And, but, you know, kids sitting in front of TV or with video games... Uh, typically with soft drink and a packet of crisps. This is a sort of behavior we want to, want to change. Uh, obesity is also something to do with individual responsibility. And a lot of fat people delude themselves. They say, I don't eat, the, I don't eat high calorie foods. And they, they lie about what they eat. We know this from doing double label water intakes. They, if you measure their energy expenditure, which should be the same as their intake, it's much higher than they report eating. Um, they have what I call biscuit amnesia. They forget the number of biscuits they eat, and they, you know, there's a chocolate gap. You know, no, there's more chocolate sold than people report consumed, and I'm sure people don't throw away chocolate. And the other thing is that people exaggerate reports of physical uh, activity. So obesity is about getting people to eat less and about getting people to be more active. It's a simple message. And proportion size, I think, is hugely important. And I think this is something where regulatory agencies have a, a role in help defining what is a reasonable portion. And this is just taking things like fried potatoes. Uh, you know, you can go from 200 to 450. And quite often, the price differential in fast food outlets is very small, that you pay, you know, only a fraction of the price to get the largest serving. So... Tackling obesity, I think, is about removing empty calories. So I would say sugar-sweetened beverages are a target, confectionery, alcoholic beverages, and added fat. Um, 
some fat is okay, but you know these you could remove all of these without uh, influencing the having adverse effects on nutrient profile. We've had dietary guidelines for many years, and the McGovern report I think was a um, a landmark report in 1977, and its its advice is pretty sound even nowadays. You know, more complex carbohydrate, naturally occurring sugars, less refined carbs, and um, you know changes in in fat and salt intake. And you know these messages are still held today. I think um, that's what they said then. Uh, you know less less meat, red meat, low-fat dairy, plenty of fruit and veg, whole grains. And the, the US guidelines now are still the same thing, codified a little bit more, balance calories with physical activity, consume a lot of emphasis of fruit and veg, whole grains, fat-free dairy, and seafood now is in, in this list. And then we still have a salt, saturated fat, added sugar, refined grains. And the, this is important because it's talking about foods rather than nutrients. And uh, John Yukin, who's my professor, said, you know, we, we eat foods, not, not nutrients. But these guidelines have been under a lot of attack recently. This uh, systematic review said, you know, it didn't in, uh, justify a report because it didn't show reductions in mortality from cardiovascular disease. And uh, there's been a lot of press saying... Uh, we should end the war on fat, and uh, we've had uh, an issue around trans fats, which is partially hydrogenated vegetable oil being linked to increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So saturated fat has taken second um, place, if you like, to trans fats in the fats war. But, I mean, we've got rid of trans fats in most of Europe, I understand. Uh, certainly have in the UK. There may be some parts of Eastern Europe where they still produce use partially hydrogenated fat, but then most of Western Europe has uh, manufacturers have got rid of it. Um, and it doesn't seem to matter in terms of cardiovascular risk reduction what you replace it with, so whether it's saturated mono or polyunsaturated. So the key issue is getting it out of, out of the diet. For some functional ingredients like bakery fats, you need a higher melting point fat, so you do, there's some case for uh, replacing it with fats are slightly higher saturated fat, but generally we would favor fats high in mono and polyunsaturated fat. And when we look at the whole issue of risk estimates now, saturated fat, I think the key issue is what we replace it with. So it looks like from the, the data from pooled analysis, and there's been a reworking of this quite recently by Frank, who published a, a, a week or so ago, basically showing if you replace saturated fat with either mono or polyunsaturated fat, you reduce risk of cardiovascular disease. In this initial analysis, it didn't look significant for monounsaturated fat, but we've now got some more data there. And carbohydrate, if it's refined carbohydrate, there's no benefit at all. It may be worse. But if it's whole grain carbohydrate, then there is a, is a benefit. So it's type of fat that matters, and it's not just focusing on saturated fat reduction, but thinking about what we replace it with. And the evidence is quite positive for polyunsaturated fat in the latest analysis, which is saying that the omega-6 fatty acids, linoleic acid, is cardioprotective. Um, there's been a lot of debate about this. Some people were saying increased linoleic acid might not be, as, might may have an adverse effect, but this one does suggest that replacing saturated with linoleic acid does contribute to reduction uh, of risk. Um, the omega-3 fatty acids found in fish, um, the evidence is better for fish than it is for omega-3 supplements. And uh, there are a lot of trials ongoing. Um, the prospective data support the relationship with, with fish consumption. Um, and there, is, there were some of the early trials did show getting people who had had a heart attack to eat fish reduced their risk of uh, cardiac death. And there's an Italian study, Gissi Heart Failure, that does actually show an effect on heart failure of fish oil supplements. But it, it's, it's, that's about the only, only one. And there's a bit of evidence that linolenic acid found in rapeseed oil may be important as well. So there could be a threshold level which has now been exceeded and so we don't see effects. Um, 
I think we need to understand what it is about low fish intake that uh, provides uh, protection against heart disease. But I think the message is polyunsaturated fats are an important part of the diet, but we need both omega-6 and omega-3. So we now focus on dietary patterns, and so the Mediterranean dietary pattern, plenty of fruit and veg, legumes, uh, small amounts of red meat, olive oil, you know, as opposed to um, some dairy in there is, is good. So Japanese-style diet seems good, and vegetarian diet also seems quite good. But all of these feature less red and processed meat. And the Americans have got this, my plate. I always laugh about this because Americans don't eat off plates. If you notice that, they eat burgers and things you can take away. But they've, they've moved so vegetables are, are consumed in larger amounts than fruits. And uh, so the biggest lot, and then you've got grains and then protein foods with, with some dairy. And I think it's, it's not a bad model. Um, and the DASH diet, I think, is quite a good example of uh, European-style food. So here we've got you know, fish, plenty of veg, whole grains, less sugary beverages. And I think this is a, a way forward uh, that's culturally acceptable. We enjoy our food in Europe. Uh, we don't want to be sort of masochists on diets. The UK has its eat well plate, uh, similar sort of thing as a bit of an argument going on about whether it should be revised, whether the glass of fruit juice should be there, sugar sweetened beverages, but I think it, it's basically okay. And I think the, the final thing I'd say about the future, I think the solutions are probably quite simple. Don't overcomplicate. They don't have to be high tech. So I think we need a shift to a more plant-based diet. It's like to benefit. It'd be good for health and climate change. Industry is really important, reformulating food. Getting rid of trans fats, reducing added sugar and salt can be helpful. And we've shown in the UK how salt reduction across the board is, is helpful. Fortification may be important for certain groups, for things like vitamin D, folic acid. Uh, but there's a risk benefit that needs to be assessed carefully in fortification. I think we need to focus on mark how food is marketed and look at the the cultural drivers for what leads to food choice, to discourage overconsumption. And key thing is, having joined the elderly population, is you know, how to keep at home and well and out of care. You know, that's, that's the key issue. And the bottom line is that increased physical activity is, is beneficial at all ages. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sanders, for the stimulating presentations and for following the time. Any questions from the audience? Let me repeat in relation to clarifications. Could you please say your name and your affiliation? Yes, thank you. I'm Poppy Canari, a member of the Advisory Forum of EFSA, and I come from Cyprus, from the Ministry of Health. Thank you for a very informative uh, presentation. Just one question. I fully support uh, your uh, su suggestions and uh, promotion of the Mediterranean diet, and this is what we do also in Cyprus as Ministry of Health. On the other hand, if we see the results from the monitoring and surveillance programs of fruits and vegetables, we see an increase in uh, pesticide residue use and actually a multi-use of pesticides in fruit and vegetables. In one apple, you may find seven different pesticides. And also, in big fish, perhaps an increase of mercury. So in the Mediterranean diet, we tell people, eat more fruit, eat more fish. But on the other hand, because it's healthier, it's nutritional, if you eat more fruit and vegetables, that means you consume more pesticides, perhaps. And if you eat big fish, not small fish, you may end up consuming uh, as a contaminant mercury at higher levels than the permitted mm -hmm. ones. So there is this risk factors from the one side, um, overdoing it with the Mediterranean diet, if you have these uh, risk factors mm -hmm. from pesticide residues and uh, heavy metals in fish. And on the other hand, eating a good nutritional uh, Mediterranean diet that concerns uh, fish and fruits and on the fibers 
and uh, mm. less meat in general. So what is your suggestion yeah. on that? Thank well, you. E eating food involves risk, okay, it's the first thing. So it's a matter of balancing out risk and benefit and the benefits of eating fish have been quite well looked at versus the risks from heavy metals, PCBs and dioxins and things like that. The risks associated with dioxins and things are, are hypothetical. The benefits associated with eating fish in terms of increased life expectancy are demonstrable through epidemiological study showing that people who consume more fish live, live longer. And I think that's, that's the bottom line. I think we need to continually monitor residue levels in food, but we have increasingly sensitive methods. We can detect sort of a grain in a normal swimming pool worth, you know, and which is not going to have a physiological effect. And quite often the main sources of, um, of persistent contaminants are actually foods of animal origin where things have increased up the food chain. So there are issues about the types of pesticides and what their biological effects are. I think the marine food chain is, is very vulnerable. Uh, and specifically on mercury, it's really confined to things like marlin, albacore tuna, but not yellowfin tuna, that these fish live so long they get mercury. So the advice we give, so for women in pregnancy, we say don't eat swordfish or marlin in pregnancy, but the levels of exposure for people outside pregnancy, you don't really have to worry about. So I think one's got to be aware that every, all food has risk. Eating nuts has a risk. People chuck them in their mouths and choke on them. You know, people choke on meat, they choke on fish bones as well. I would say the biggest risk for fish is probably actually choking on the bones rather than pesticide residues. Okay. So it's risk and benefit. And at the moment, the evidence supports eating fruit and vegetables over hypothetical associated risks from things which you can measure in food. Does that make sense? Well, thank you for being brief. I, I'm sure this is an issue that preoccupies other, uh, mm. uh, the minds of other people in the audience, so maybe we can readdress the yeah. issue during the discussion. Uh, I don't think we have time for... Uh, is it a short question on a clarification? Yes, please. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, for a wonderful presentation. My name is Mary Flynn. I work for the Food Safety Authority of Ireland. I just would like, Tom, if he could be very brief, but let us know as regulatory agencies how we could regulate portion size. Because in Europe, our label is 100 grams. We know it would be impossible to get universal agreement on portion sizes for all the different foods. So are you thinking of maybe somehow regulating the upsizing of portions? Or what were you thinking? Thank you. Well, I mean, I think you've got to look at foods which are if they're nutrient dense, what a portion might be. So with something like cheese, a portion of cheese might only be 30 grams, that provides quite a lot, because it's a, a dry food, or like a breakfast cereal is a dry food, but something that's a wet food, you'd have a different portion size. But I'm thinking particularly of drinks, um, it's quite easy to do what is a reasonable size for a drink. And I'm very well aware in the UK, we have glasses of wine, and we used to say a, a, a glass of wine is 125 mil. A small glass now is 160 mil. But a big glass is, is 350. I think in confectionery areas, I think there is a, a real problem where people are selling 100 gram bars of chocolate. When you, on, in, you go into a newsagent in the UK, you buy a magazine. They said, would you like a bar of chocolate for one pound, which is very cheap? and it's 100 grams and at 600 calories. Whereas if it was only you know, 30 grams, it wouldn't be such an issue. So I think it's, and that is an issue. Ready meal, a lot of people are buying ready meals and I think we could have guidelines what it could be, what you would expect the calorie amount would be in a, in a meal, whether it's a, a third or half the calorie intake for a day. But I, I think the problem is are things like snack foods and packets of crisps where pack size has been getting bigger and people need to know where it's going. It's, there's been some advance where fast food chains have put um, calories on but it's in quite often in quite small print or in blue print so you can't read it very well. Uh, and you know, there is an issue about people knowing what foods are fattening. A lot of people have no idea they, when they buy a packet of nuts for example 
they think, oh, nuts are good for you. They don't realize, you know, there are nearly six calories per gram in nuts. And, you know, even though nuts are healthy, you can eat too many of them. And I think that's, you need to educate people to be aware of what foods make them fat. It's not just, you know, sugary drinks are the problem. It's calories in. Thank you very much again.